great job. Ted Nugent, where's Ted Nugent? Where's Ted? Huh? Look at you. You doing well? You are a handsome devil. Thank you. Great job, Ted. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. And now, it's time for Ted Nugent's Spirit Campfire with John Brankus. It's the physics of spirituality with attitude. Powered by Patriot Mobile. Switch now. Go to patriotmobile.com slash Ted. is good friends and a bottle of wine. Happy December 28th, 2020. We're still yep. celebrating Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy almost the end of 2020. God bless America. God bless the Spirit Campfire. Brinkins, how you God doing? God bless. God bless. I'm doing amazing, Uncle Ted. So uh, our room is on fire tonight, and there are a lot of people who've been celebrating Christmas. And they've been kind of pent up. They were told to stay inside, but I think they went outside. And uh, everybody, listen, we're monitoring the room very closely tonight because Ted has agreed to dedicate a lot of the hour to music. And he's going to be taking requests. But what you must first do is give us a thumbs up, give us a like, and tell one friend to come watch the Spirit Campfire. Come join us around the campfire. Uncle Ted's going to be playing. Uncle Ted, can you lower the your camera a little bit so we can see the can. guitar a little more? That's the only thing in my life I'm willing to lower, by the way, John. I got to tell you, this is a <laughs> this is a 1959. You know, there is Holy Grail. Um, I can't think of many examples. Probably the original uh, uh, Carroll Shelby uh, uh, Cobra is a Holy Grail of the automotive muscle car world, and maybe a right. 1970 440 four-speed positive traction Hemi Cuda. But this here, in my greasy Motor City, 10 digits of doom, barbecue fingers, is a 1959 Kalamazoo, Michigan, Les Paul, that Keith Urban, the country western guy that's got the funny haircut, married that yeah. long-legged pretty blonde. Um, yeah. Keith Urban offered me $350,000 for this 1959 Les Paul. It's literally an iconoclastic masterpiece of luthierology, uh, guitar manufacturing masters, and it literally is the holy grail of electric guitars. And I own this one in a 1958, and it plays like butter. <laughs> So I'm going Good. to play this tonight, and this is a guitar, a guitar player's dream guitar. Plus, I have my son, 
somewhere around here, Rocco Winchester Nugent. My son, Theodore Fleetwood Nugent, born in yep. 1968 in, uh, in New York City, October 28, 1968. Fleetwood was going to join me because he and his beautiful family uh, run what is the premier restaurant in Staten Island, New York, called the Richmond. And because of the... Uh, the Marxist bureaucrats, boy, Cuomo and de Blasio and all the, you know, corrupt politicians and power abusers there are literally shutting down the hardest working entrepreneurs. And my son Fleet was going to share the uh, pain and suffering and the the uh, hypocrisy and the do as I say, but don't do as I do uh, abuse of power running amok in New York. But because he had a failed uh, Wi-Fi power adequate to deliver the spirit of the spirit campfire, Instead, I have Rocco Winchester Nugent, who's going oh, to join Oh, look at that. Here. Look who's joining us. Rocco, hey, what's Rocco's up, Rocco? Here from California, and I'm proud to introduce Rocco Winchester Nugent, my loving son who I adore and I'm so very proud of. Wow. Hey, Rocco, thanks for joining us around the Spare Campfire. You're, uh, the, we made this little program together, and it's gotten an amazing response. And thanks for sharing your dad with everybody. Yeah, man. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So, Rocco, how, tell them how old you are and um, the, your incredible journey of uh, climbing um, uncharted territories and mountaintops of heretofore um, unconquered peaks um, as a 30-year-old uh, son of the crazy guitar player from Detroit. Give us a, a synopsis of uh, your good friends and a bottle of wine spirit camp fireology. So... You know, I grew up with this guy right next to me, and I'm basically, by the time of 17, I couldn't figure out what he figured out. And I went looking for what did he figure This is our this mom. Is you get over Get over it. <laughs> She's beautiful. Here. She's beautiful. But Rocco wow, she's beautiful. Talk, I'll, jump, I'll jump in. Okay. Uh, Go on. Yeah, my life's purpose basically started when, or at least, I mean, I've always been on my purpose, but I felt like I got called to a mission. When I was in Los Angeles, I had booked like a, a couple movie roles. I had started making music. Um, and I knew I wanted to be great at whatever I did. And I had an example of that, but I, I didn't quite see how to do it. And I started feeling depressed. I started uh, feeling disconnected with how to do it. And then I had a friend uh, that took his life. And I saw this reality that a lot of people face with uh, depression and how it can sometimes lead to a thing called suicide and how when we're not connected to the source from which we come, something malfunctions in the mind, something malfunctions or, or goes awry in the emotions. And it became my obsession really kind of simultaneously as I wanted artistic excellence, I wanted metaphysical excellence. I wanted the, the pair to happen. Because I had this example of artistic excellence, and then this lady got a master's degree in metaphysics, <laughs> and I found myself uh, urged to make them both proud, but also urged to uh, yeah, unify my own duality. And so I went seeking for this thing that many people have heard of and I think it's gotten uh, a, a bit of a, a bad rap from modern society called enlightenment and I saw that it's really about being empowered and inspired and when you're inspired you're in spirit and spirit is the light that we come from and when someone's really empowered and connected to their purpose they can't help but do what lights them up and by doing that they light others up just like a full moon that's in the nighttime sky shining light in what otherwise looks dark and it's like the the light of the sun is getting where it needs to go the light of my son brancus i want your response mm -hmm. to that that sol soliloquy of my son rocco winchester Nugent. was that moving or what it is it's super moving you know it's the uh but it's very new esque right i mean if you're gonna do something you gotta like do it and I love how he's articulating how he wanted it. He was, you know, had this model of excellence. It's got to be hard, you know, having a super famous dad who's super successful and trying to, you know, at least meet that level. It's very hard. But what it sounds to me like what Rocco has realized is that it's not fame and fortune. It's really, you know, it's all spirit, you know, the spiritual truth. So it seems to me like he's, you know, not only follow, following in your footsteps, but 
you know, at least meeting it and perhaps when it's all said and done, surpassing it. You know, John, you're one of the rare guys. Well, I guess not. I take that back because uh, we have seen in my circle of life that have been the guests at the Spirit Campfire, which is why I spontaneous, I think I answered your question of what would we call our podcast probably before the last Spillable. podcast I hit, <laughs> hit my ears. I said Spirit Campfire because my life, as I've said many times before, and it's worth repeating, my yeah. life has been a series of campfires, both literal and figurative. And Rocco brings up the light. Well, there is a light from both the literal and the figurative campfire where you're open, uninhibited, and you're willing to share your inner deepest thoughts, maximizing the excellence and the positive energy. And certainly you understand that, that you have, you have mirrored those sentiments and those pulses and, and, and John, so has every one of our guests. And by the way, let's tell the audience, we didn't sit down. John and I never sat down and go, what should be the qualifications of our guests? Should they be spirit? We never discussed it. Naturally, the people who were invited to our campfire from Billy Gibbons and Mark Farner to my band and Sarah Palin and the comedians and uh, every, is this not a consistent tribe of lighters people who bring light are, yeah. it, are we are we weird or are do we represent I, the vast majority of humans i think we do i think that this is my opinion my opinion is that one-on-one -on -one, everyone gets along i think as a human as as human beings one-on-one -on -one, they get along and when you start getting 10 on 10 and 100 on 100 and so on you, the descent gets lost. It becomes cacophonous because no no one's listening to any one voice. They're listening to a giant wave. And it's very difficult to discern what's really being said. And I think that's what's going on in, in media now is that you have such a cacophonous wave coming that it doesn't it doesn't sound lyrical and rhythmical. Like it, it's too hard to decipher for us. So we are retreating. Uh, all of us are retreating to finding people one-on-one -on -one who we get along with. And this spirit campfire is a perfect example of, look, you and I are like cut from the same cloth and every guest that we have on, uh, we, it's not even like we rap about politics or religion or whatever. We're, they're just present. And if you are present, then we're in. Yeah. And Shemaine yeah. does podcasts all the time and that's what you exude. I mean, she not only is the most beautiful creature that ever walked the earth and into my room every night, but she's also the smartest and the, the glowing spirituality of a human brotherhood, sisterhood. And Shemaine, you do such a great job of that. Thank you. Um, your book and your, your presentations, your speeches, your TV, your podcast, you've had an awful lot of encounters. We never, we never, like, vet anybody. We just invite people, and we've never we had do. a dirt bag. And I think one-on-one, -on -one, John's right. Like, one-on-one, -on -one, when you have a conversation with somebody, it's a lot different than when you have the opportunity to strike the keyboard mm. and say nasty things. So I think we need more of one-on-one -on -one or even Zoom calls. But I do have to correct you on something on your, on your lower ticker tape. Um, you have to write Shemaine Nugent dot rocks, not Shemaine dot rocks. Okay, Shemaine uh -oh. Nugent dot rocks. Herbert, change, <laughs> the, I, change I, the crawl. Yes, Herbert. I'm going to blame Herbert. Crawl. I'm selling but him out because I don't have anything think, to do with that. I think <laughs> Ted and Rocco and you are both an exuberation of what everyone else needs to do is to follow their own path. It doesn't look like what Ted does or what Rocco does or what I do and we're all dressed differently we all act differently but it, at the end of the day we come together we're humanity we love each other and we love human beings and I think that's what's really most important in life is we got to get back to loving one another yes there are major differences but overall the majority of the people that you encounter Ted and Rocco are loving human beings and let, let me interject all right i agree and, and I, I, i'm surrounded by love but how do you get an arsonist to be loving well i have a question for john actually go on i'm so, full of answers john have you ever heard of a term called fomo of course so i uh, i have this theory fear of missing out yeah so i have this theory that both the fear of missing out and also the feeling of missing out 
instigates for many the nervous system to actually disconnect from their own soul awareness and identify as a herd group thought. And if they have someone nearby, socially, a loved one, maybe a person they look up to, maybe they grew up in a household that was a little dysfunctional and so they had to look outside of that household for someone that gave them permission to be like they were and then that gave them a political orientation. Uh, how much, uh, and I hear you guys talking about you don't magnetize, uh, you know, unlike people to these conversations that you're having, which I, I'm you know, not surprised by that, but I feel like there's a lot of, and what I've witnessed on the interweb is, this is how the algorithm works. It gives you more of what you're already looking for. And, but what I feel like is really needing to happen is more of these conversations and the, uh, the company Vice, they do a great job of like putting, you know, Republican and Democrat people together to talk about a conversation and putting a camera on it. But my question is to you, how much effect do you feel like the feeling or the fear of missing out on what others are doing or even sometimes believing, how much does that affect people's actual vote or people's orientation to their own political identity? I think, unfortunately, most people, this is just my opinion, I think most people go through a period in their life where they do feel like they are not where they're supposed to be. They feel like they missed the boat, they missed out. And the truth is that you are always exactly where you are supposed to be. You cannot be revisionist and you can't say, oh, if I made a bunch of money when I was younger, I wouldn't be here because if you made a bunch of money when you were younger, you could have bought a car and gotten in a car crash and you'd be dead. You don't well, know what the outcome would have been. And it's an exercise in futility to say, well, I missed out on something. The only thing that you can miss out on is the present moment. And you know, you know what the term. I got, I got, I got to interject, and then I'm going to let you two have it. Go on. I got it. Um, when we first met, we were in your Corvette. We went to lunch. You yes, it was awesome. She your looked Corvette. so good. And she smelled so good. He was talking all about himself and everything, and and you went around a corner really fast. And I have quick reflexes because I was an athlete. I was a state champion. I don't think swimmer. I was talking about myself. I think I was asking about you, but go ahead. No, you, no, because I'll get to that point. <laughs> um, and you went around a corner and your radar detector flew what? off the windshield and I just literally went Shh, and I snagged, I, I snagged it because I used to race motocross. I all about the start. I'm the first one off the line. Swim meets, everything. But my point is, I asked you at one point when we were initially i don't even know if it was a when she was flirting with me yeah i was never flirting with you <laughs> but i said do you want to know anything about me and you said no because whatever you've done in the past made you who you are today and i love you do you remember that yes yes i don't think it was quite framed not that i didn't want to know anything about you um, I don't because I'm always fascinated by everything about you. It's the first thing I do with people is I want to know where they come from and what their beliefs are. But it didn't matter. That's what, what yeah. it didn't matter because the person that I've discovered has gone through a journey that makes yes. this person who's here right now that I'm falling in love with. Yeah. yeah. Let yeah. me let me ask you too. So, am I just a belligerent, lucky son of a bitch that I've never ever had the thought enter my stratosphere my world of possibly missing out on anything i've been so yeah. like yeah. i'm so busy just going berserk for the things that turn me on and i love that yeah. i never go geez i i wonder i wonder if i missed out on anything here's one more of my questions for you john because i this is what i live with all the damn time <laughs> and he's obviously not missing out on nothing nothing but how much, as a, as an outsider of this new Gentian DNA structure, how much, how many people out there do you feel like do have this sense of missing out and are therefore kind of weaponized by culture? And that's what these different politicians like yeah. poke at. That's a fascinating. Are you question. seeing que uh, questions and comments now, John? I am. I I am. There are a ton in here, and everybody's talking about in the uh, chat room. Everyone's talking about being present. I mean, here's here's the thing that I've learned. The older that I have gotten, I feel like the more curious I am and empathetic I am. When I sure. see someone who is not 
clearly not uh, in the same same sort of state of mind that I am, where I feel very happy, very fulfilled. When I see someone who's down on their luck or someone who's angry, when I was younger, I used to be like, oh, man, that was just because. And then I would assign reasons to it. But honestly, I become more empathetic because I don't know how people arrived at this particular moment in time and why they are the way that they are. And I can't assign, well, it was because of a bunch of bad choices or it was because of a bunch of whatever. I don't know what happened. And I'm therefore, I become very empathetic and very curious because I want to know, is there something that I am not seeing or realizing? Maybe you are just a bad person. Maybe you have just made a lot of bad decisions or maybe you are the recipient uh, on the wrong end of life and you've never had a strong friend circle or family or love or religion that's helped you through it. I, I, I become very curious on uh, what someone's state actually is. Curiosity and empathy are, are, are critical elements to the human experience. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject one more story and then I really will. I love when you do that. And I yeah, really you will do. let you. That's why I invited you here because you're a fascinating woman. I will, I will let you guys, because I think it's fascinating to hear, you know, father, son, and obviously two different realm there would be no sun without you this is true this is true, this is true. right so uh, on that point of b becoming empathetic i've been teaching group fitness classes since 1980 for over 40 years and she's very fit. and i remember really i was teaching a class there was 50 people in my class and this one woman would always come in and she w didn't have all the exact same moves but i thought you know what you do your own thing it's, it's great that we can all come together for one hour a few times a week. And after a class one time, she said, I know it looks like I have two left feet, but I am the sole caretaker of both of my parents who have Alzheimer's, and I need these two hours every week to fill up my cup. And so I, th I said, of course, you know, you, you do you. You, you know, do whatever you wanna do, and I'm, I'm so glad that you're here. Well, another day she came in, and she came in a little bit late and there was this gentleman following her and he didn't you know he looked like he didn't know exactly where he was going and sometimes we would go in one direction and he would go in the other direction and after class my job as a fitness instructor is to make sure everybody's safe and not exactly that they all have the same moves but after class she came up to me and she said Shemaine, I want to introduce you to the same woman who told me that she was the sole caretaker of both her parents who had Alzheimer's. She came up to me and she said, I want to introduce you to my son. He's blind. So no, mm. she also had to take care of a blind son mm -hmm. in addition to both her, her parents. You never know what people are going through. So with that, yeah. I leave it to you two. And it's good to see you, John, and everybody else out there. Great to see you. Um, have yeah. a great day, and I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Great that's to see my you. wife. Hi. That's my soulmate, Shemaine Nugent. How that is your soulmate. You know, and, and, on that, and on that story where, we, you know, we talked about, you know, taking care of, of your parents and your son is blind. And, you know, we hear all these stories, um, you know, real life stories of people's situation. And the reality is, while we, from our point of view, look at someone else and say, oh, my God, what a that is a tough life to deal with. It's only relative to yourself. So it one person's terrible situation could be their heaven. They could be really happy. And it's shame on us for looking at someone else and saying, oh, their life is so inferior to mine. That's what a lot of people do. And it's kind of like the fear of missing out also becomes inverted where it's sort of the the projection of what someone should be because we don't know what makes that person happy or how what makes them tick so that's why i become very curious and empathetic um and that's why around the campfire you know honestly as we're meeting guests and exchanging stories the reason why we all get along is the number one thing that this campfire does is we listen yeah. We let people no, talk. We do share. We have some great uh, families here on my uh, birthday hunt. We got some families joining us tomorrow. They'll be coming into Texas to have my New Year's Eve. Uncle Ted, 
you know, backstrap bash party. And uh, we got the, the big bonfire yeah. ready to go. And we got the upper deck ready with the uh, Rectech grill. And we got some backstraps marinating. And I got some mallards. And uh, by the way, fast food at my house is a mallard. Um, and, right. and we're going we're gonna to be going to the shooting range. And Rock is going to help out because we take our hunters to the different stands based on the wind and the game activity and the, uh, the trails and the, where they're feeding. But Rocco is here uh, after uh, an adventure out in California witnessing uh, pretty much everything between his upbringing and his roadness, his road adventures, has seen pretty much everything that I think life has to offer so far for a 30-year-old. But where do you think the difference occurs under what circumstances that you would apply energy and thought to what you might be missing out on versus identifying your life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness and putting that energy towards something that you won't miss out on. I've, I've, I don't think I've missed out on anything uh, because the music and the, the nature and the archery and the wildlife and the hunting, the fishing, the trapping, the marksmanship, the, the girls, the, the youthful sexual adventure, finding my soulmate with your mother, creating you, Oh my God, I'll go to bed tonight completely worn out like I have for 72 years and four days because I never thought about missing out because I was too busy that, Living. that eliminated, eliminated any missing out. You're missing out on nothing. I missed, I missed out on nothing. How Am I just belligerent, bullheaded, or just luckier than shit? Well, I had a friend named Nolan who asked me this question of like, do you believe in luck? recently and I over the past four years got initiated into this thing called Kriya and Raja Yoga so a lot of Westerners think yoga is just like stretching your body that's just one eighth of what yoga as a system is meant to provide which is really just oneness integral you full you and I'm full me you're full you and and my kind of study as a you know as adolescence became teenage early 20s I became fascinated. I was like, well, why doesn't everybody just miss out on nothing? Why doesn't everybody just pick up the thing? Yeah, really, why not? Quit missing out. Go for it. Go nuts. Get up early. Totally. Go wild. Stay out. up late. St be clean and sober so your radar doesn't miss out on anything. So as I wave my glass of wine around the room. So Good my, friends and a bottle of wine. My theory is, and what my path has shown me, is that uh, we are all a soul that has awareness through a body and we're moving through a crystalline prism that many have heard the popular term for it as Christ. And it's a mutual indwelling. That which you are, I am, he is, we are. I agree. I am. And so something happens in life that causes a soul, a spirit, to either concave or convex or stay neutral, which is, I think, more rare and this word for this thing is called trauma and some people get dented in and they become frozen or they become inwardly behind their mind and it's it's what happened their life put them a different way you have told me these stories of how you're you just had to pick up a slingshot you just had to pick up and but your brother didn't no, neither Jeff nor they Johnny. They did briefly. They did briefly, but, but for passion. whatever reason, your essence was absolutely ferociously magnetized to this pathway. Mm -hmm. And your birthday happens to be December 13th, which causes the sun to be right here when you were born and <gasps> took your first breath of air. And so my study showed that some souls get actually traumatized into hyperactivity so that they won't miss out. And some souls get traumatized into passivity that prevents them from uh, doing what they came to do. And it, it leads them either towards the thing that they have to heal or away from it, which is, I, I'm sure all of us can feel someone in our life that we've met, which is, it causes us that feeling of sadness or like you said, John, empathy. Um, so I think the word karma, which I don't know, I don't think many Westerns, I sure, I sure didn't have the understanding of what that meant before Raja and Kriya Yoga helped me see it, which karma means action. So you asked me what's the difference between 
those who miss out and those who miss out on nothing, I would say it's probably a, a word that you love, action. Action. But a word, Taking action. But a word that also, yeah, but inspired action is, yeah. is very different than, I'm sure, I mean, you've told me about people that, you know, bless their hearts, they got up and, you know, go to a nine to five and their whole life went by and they're in their 72nd year of life and they felt like they missed out on everything. I've hmm. looked into the eyes of a person who didn't have that brightness that he did. So that made me look towards like, well, what the heck is that? And I must comment on the nine to five thing. That is a, a, a honorable pursuit. And I know many nine to fivers who are at my campfires that manage a, a grocery store or that own a hardware store or is just a clerk at a, at a, at a farm and fleet uh, uh, rural uh, 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 enterprise. Just down to earth, I, turn, I use the term shit kickers. And I gotta tell you, they might not be quite as buoyant and hyper and 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 <laughs> maniacal about the things that they love, but they're happy. I would say they're content. And there are many who I've met who are actually blissful and pleasant. I met yes. this guy at the the post office, and you know, it, everybody's got masks on. He's just behind the counter eating the apple. Oh yeah, he's no my mask. buddy. Yeah, they'll peer chat his brain. No mask, and he's just talking. This is Connecticut. Um, oh, Connecticut. And, and, okay. he's, and he's eating an apple. And he's like, uh, he's like, good day to you. And me and my girlfriend were like, well, wow, that's a bright person out of the normal people that you meet. We went to Whole Foods before that uh, errand, and no one at the actual checkout even talked to us, looked at us, or spoke to. No, there was no interaction. They were just this, this, and it was like, wow, man, it's so wow. Then we go to the post office. Let's jump on that for a second. Here's a little Uncle Ted, John Brankus, Rock of Winchester, Shemaine, Brotherhood spirit campfire recommendation look people in the eye just next time you're at pumping gas say hi to the guy pumping next to you i always had as a kid i didn't know who he was and i didn't care who he was I go, how you doing you see any ducks <laughs> i mean i would just strike up a conversation or if you're working at a ga or at whole foods how about us i've actually said to these people whether well, and i go hey hey judy how did you know my name? It says it right there on your shirt. Um, hey, Judy, smile for me. You got a great gig here. This is Whole Foods, baby. You got some killer meat back there and some nice fish and some great homemade bread. I want to smile out of you, Judy. And John, Rock, they do. They immediately smile. But here's a little tip for everybody. If you're if you at the Ted Nugent Spirit Campfire with John Brankus and my son Rocco, and we've talked about this before. It's so simple. Let this campfire create an army of smilers and conversationalists. Strike up a pleasant, positive. I mean, you were moved when that guy actually inquired, how you doing? Just a simple gesture like that. And the whole thing of waving at people. Some people actually get angry when I wave at them. What the hell does he want? I just... I'm just waving. I just want to say hello. <laughs> and then most people, hey, how you doing? Hey, that was Uncle Ted. Um, this could be a great um, launch pad. And I think we have been, John. I mean, I'd like to get from uh, from Courtney and Linda. What is this? This got to be our 100th? Is this our 100th spirit campfire, maybe? Something like that? No, I don't know if it's 100, but it's getting close. It sure feels like it. Um, a bottom line... <laughs> In a good well, I don't know it does because it seems like I've known you forever. It seems like this is another one of my, I don't know if it's a million, but it feels like a million campfires with a million people. And even when I'm on my Facebook, we get some funny stuff going. We People are upbeat and cocky. I think I inspire upbeat and cockiness. And I'd like everybody at the Spirit Campfire, go forth, inspire grins, inspire waves, inspire upbeat cockiness. That's the missing link. And if you got somebody that won't be upbeat and cockiness, I know you can make them smile. I've made people that look like they had a permanent frown, and within seconds, I'll get that son of a bitch to crack a smile. You, you and I, almost, I, think we, I think we can be the launch pad, John. I think I we know, have I'm been. telling you, that's our, that's our mission. Um, that's our mission, you know? And I think that you've been able to do that with your words and with your music. My question is, you have your three hundred fifty thousand um, dollar guitar sitting right next to you. Are you gonna Are you gonna pick it up and play a little bit of? Uh, I will now, Rocco. I'm, we're gonna get. Some I know the, the room is going nuts, saying we need to hear Teddy. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm gonna play. This is gonna take a little time. You can 
Blues singing. This is going to take a little time because I'm going to actually play, and I haven't practiced this in an awful long time, but I have a song called Sunrise that I played originally on a Fender bass six, six string bass, and I'm going to try it on my 1959 Les Paul. And it goes like this, kind of. By the way, I've never done that movement ever before in my life. And I like that. I've never played that ever before. That was a real treat, Ted. It was a treat playing it. I was out of body. All there was was I, my son and my spirit and the love and the faith and the belief and the positive energy that is so ubiquitous in my life. And John, thank you. Rocco, thank you. Rocco was, Rocco was in a trance, a loving right. trance. That's my life in sound. 
right. dynamics, the subtleties, the, the power, the, the authority, the humbleness of accepting the light from my everyday life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness that is not unique to America because I know people in Africa that feel that, people in Ireland that feel that, my buddies in Spain, people over there in Bulgaria, Germany, and France, and all across Canada. God bless my Canadian friends. But it's those campfires with those flickering flames that have imprinted like a, a mother goose to a gosling so that the gosling follows the mother for life. And I'm following that light that, for life. You know, what's interesting, Ted, is I know that you are not, um, I know that you've never taken a guitar lesson and you don't dive deep into the theory. What's interesting is that that, that particular composition is was sort of following the circle of fifths. And it's, it's so beautiful the way that it kept pushing to the next chord and kept pushing. And ultimately, our ear wanted to resolve it, but you would tease it and pull it back. And it just kept you, it kept us in the moment so much that it, and that's what's so interesting about your music is that it ends up, it ends up following something that's, that from a purely theoretical basis would be, well, this is where it's going to go, but you always pull it back and make it something that's just slightly unexpected. So it keeps us in. That's like your, that's your composition. And I know you don't think about it that way, but that is what ultimately is, is brilliant about it. Well, well, thank you for that, John. I know, you know, I, I, it's hard to be, you know, humble. And I don't mean that in a pricky way, though. I'm really good at pricky ways. But the, the love that I get from people at the clay pot restaurant, the guys that came and cleaned my windows today, um, the, the, the guy that cleans Shemaine's pool, everybody's got a Ted Nugent music story. And they express that they were moved, either in an outrageous, sexy, defiant, middle finger on fire, dancing maniac night, or that they used my music to say goodbye to their grandpa at the grave. What, what the hell is that? And what yeah. it is, is my radar. My radar doesn't miss well, it misses something because I'm human. I would say that it's the light moving through you because you have allowed yourself to get into that. If you didn't pick up the guitar, if you avoided that thing, you would have never given that. That light would have never moved through you in that way. So that light that is the campfire when we gather around it, it's the, lift, it's the gift that keeps giving. Well, let me uh, correct you slightly, John. I, I did take guitar lessons from Joe Podorsik at the Capitol well, School of Music on Grand River yeah. for a couple of years, but I, ne I never learned anything correctly. But he, right. he allowed me to unleash. And what you witnessed there is I might have stumbled into some fifths and some sevenths and an occasional ninth, I guess. Um, and I do know what they are, but I never look at my guitar neck and anticipate a moving finger. My ears guide these things, and yeah. these things guide my ears, and this guides the whole wad. I love putting you a bit on the spot because you, you love to, like, rise up and do it. You have your acoustic guitar behind you. Have you ever played Stranglehold slow and acoustic in a, you know, in a getting down to its essence without it, you know, sounding like Stranglehold? Around many campfires. Ooh. That's a that's a great you know I can tell that you know by the way John you are not unique you are a real music lover and there's herds of us out here that really listen that really listen and I've I've been doing Ted Nugent hunts since my 50th birthday and this is just a little portable Taylor guitar that I got from the wonderful Calvin Ross at Lone Star um, Music in Waco. And a rock, can you imagine the lights dimming and there's just a fire going, there's a good looking woman with a glass of wine and a guy comes in telling us the story of a great arrow on a nice buck and somebody's dog is around the fire and my dogs are on the fire and they're sniffing people's legs and asses. And there's an uninhibitedness that is just so spectacularly raw and primal around most campfires and definitively around mine.
because they know that the reason they wanted to hunt with him is because they know that I just don't hold back. I, I, I won't hold back. Now, if, if I'm meeting someone's family and, and they're not so sure of me, I'll, I'll hold back a little bit. I won't sing Wango Tango right away. Um, I, I, so I, am, I know I can improvise, adapt, and overcome. But think of a dark night, some stars, the moon, usually a sliver when we're hunting, and tired people from a day in the great outdoors of living, breathing, primal screaming. And you tell me that this isn't that soundtrack. telling you, the crackling of the embers, it's the drums. You, you hear how I sometimes beat on, and I'm getting a lot of, a lot of counter rhythms going, a lot, of, a lot of hard hits and a lot of almost indiscernible hits. That's that Bo Diddley, that Chuck Berry, that's that Howlin' Wolf crying because he was a slave, and he, he hated being a slave. He knew it was wrong, but he didn't know how to get out of it. And, and muddy waters and lightning Hopkins, that pain, the blues, the gospel, the begging for freedom. And that's what I was, that's the music I was raised on, so I've got that angst. And then the Phoenix Rising and the Emancipation Musical Proclamation, free, free at last. And I give you Chuck Berry got an amplifier, Long Tall Sally, ball all night long, little Richard. So I'd like to think that I have the cocktail of human emotion and lowest of lows and highest of highs, maybe higher than any. That's what I it, think those songs are. I, I really do. And if you even look at a graph, um, it's in, interesting how that, that first of all, what you just played was such a treat. We're going to clip that out and put it up um, just because for those who haven't watched Spirit Campfire, that is, that is what this is all about. And what's interesting about what you just played and when you look at it objectively, you are keeping our interest. You are keeping our interest with the rhythm. It is just those 16th notes thrown in there. Just and a couple of 30 up. seconds, too. <laughs> there was a little, brr, little 30 now, second, and, 16 notes. But then you add, and it, I'll, I'll do it. I mean, the song I started out, I mean, obviously it's a crank, you know. <laughs> Good friends in the bottle line. But that's the lyrics. I think I know your condition. I've been down that road before. Maybe it's just superstition, baby. But there's one little ditty I got in store, and I got to have his own good friends in a bottle of wine. Good friends, they show me good time. Good friends and a bottle of wine. I'm so glad I got what I got. 
Maybe I like to go crazy. Maybe I just like to scream. Maybe my vision gets hazy, baby. One little ditty, I think I need. I got to have me some good friends and a bottle of wine. Good friends, bottle of wine. Good friends, they show me good time. I think I'm no glad what I got, baby. Now the last verse goes. I know that life has its moments. Sometimes up, sometimes down. Identify your opponents, baby, and gather all your good friends around. I got to have me some good friends and a bottle of wine. Good friends, they show me good time. Good friends and a bottle of wine. So glad I got what I got, baby. I'm so glad. So, yeah, it's a roustabout, outrageous, crank and grind and sexy breeding piece of music. But those lyrics are, are humankind. I, I think I know your condition. I've been down that road before. Maybe it's just superstition, but I got one little ditty and I got it in store. Good friends and a bottle of wine. A lot of people went, I thought you didn't drink. That's not the point. <laughs> That's not the point of that. It, it means that I'm open to what makes you happy. Oh, Ted, man, this is this has been a real treat. And for those who um, have joined us tonight, you were the, listen, you've been treated to something that I certainly we've been doing this now, whether it's 100 times or however many episodes you've never played Stranglehold like that. You've never played that song like that. And every time we get together, it's a great time. Good is a word you use when something is not great. This is a great time. Well, thank you, John. I I feel great. I'm surrounded by greatness. I pursue, cultivate, reward, demand greatness. Uh, I'm a man in the arena. I'm, a, I'm like everybody else. I stumble, but I get back up and brush myself off and charge back in there. So yep. as we started off with Rocco talking about the fear of missing out, and I know Rocco says, well, Dad, it's not that easy for everybody when I say things like, well, then just don't miss out. Well, here's, here's the answer to missing out. Don't miss out. And, and Rocco will always remind, well, sometimes it's not that easy. Okay, I'm not saying it's easy. Nothing worthwhile is easy. Nothing. I've been hunting every day. I haven't killed jack squat, except for the ducks that Sadie Happy and Coco brought back to me. They were just awesome and delicious. There was no more, another samurai dog moment everybody's got this fire i know you've got it the culture seems to deter it and the culture seems to you know well he's egotistical well this poor guy needs some self-esteem well he got no he won the race now he's egotistical oh shut the fuck up he's he self-esteem comes from the man in the arena doesn't matter how many times you fall down getting up is self-esteem so yeah so thank you for the positive yeah. energy this this campfire has been just a stone cold positive awakening and i'm already awake but i can be more awake and i guess the the, the trick with fear of missing out is take a deep breath and i'm going to say it again get the poisons out of your life Get the drugs and the alcohol and the tobacco. Get the shitty food. If you can't pronounce it, don't buy it. And for God's sakes, don't eat it. Start by spirit management, which means good health. The spirit will never be healthy if the temple isn't. So the campfire, I think we've, a lot of people go, I know, Ted, you keep saying that. Well, I'm going to keep saying it because I see people out there that are still searching and I'm still searching. But my point is, is that I haven't got all the answers, but I've got some. But you sit down to cultivate the flame. You, you notice when there's a flame in you, and you, what happens when the fire's about to dwindle out? You add another, you add another I, log. I get down there and blow so on it, it get the like, embers going. It yeah. feels like that's what both of y'all are doing and cultivating here in this space, is you're cultivating where the light has an opportunity to, to blossom. 
Yep. So again, John, wow. thank you and Courtney and Herbert and everybody and, oh, yeah. and everybody go be sure you tell your friends about the spirit campfire and be sure totally. that you get a hold. You know, some of my buddies, a bunch of people from spirit campfire has actually sent emails and letters to Patriot Mobile thanking them. And Patriot oh, yeah. Mobile is blown away that people will take the time out to do that. John, that is another example of the missing link. If you see something good, thank them. If you see something yeah. bad, help them make it good. And that's what they're doing. Again, thank you, Patriot Mobile. And thank you for the people that reach out to them because John and I were here because we have a sponsor. And we come right. every Monday night and Patriot Mobile is the wind beneath our wings. And I'm a peregrine falcon. And I'm diving down to the coil right now. So uh, Merry Christmas every day. Happy New Year. I will see you. It will still will it, it'll be 2021 when I see you, won't it? It'll be 2021. That's right. Is that Next, how that uh, works? Good. February 4th. It's going to be deep into 2021. Oh, it'll be all the four days into the new year. Dude, John, I mean, the fact that we year, made it this man. far is miraculous. Yep. <laughs> Happy New Year. I, I will go out, even though we're going a little bit over tonight, I will go out playing something for everyone on Happy New Year. John, thank you. Um, thank you him. for uh, having Rocco and Shemaine on here because they are the light in my life. And John, I got to tell you, you, you are the light in my life. You are a smart son of a bitch. You are a focused, prioritized, <laughs> um, positive guy. And I'm, I'm proud to call you my spirit campfire blood brother, man. I mean, we have a blast. So. I uh, look in 2021. We're gonna have it's gonna be the best year ever. You wanna know why? Because we're here, and we're just gonna build upon success. Success begets. All right, success. I'm gonna play a little something for you.
Happy New Year, everybody.